Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's event. I'm just going to quickly run through some admin slides, and then we're going to get straight into it with our first presenter. So this is the first, uh, many of you might have attended our Coffee Microcaps morning meeting. This is the first uh, sector specialist event that I'm running, uh, focusing on the medical devices area where we've tried to bring uh, four companies together, all from the one sector to kind of give a broad overview of their individual stories. And I guess some of the trends that are maybe in common across all four and get a little bit of insight from, you know, four different companies in the one sector about, uh, you know, what are the big drivers there? So we're hopefully going to be doing a sector specialist conference uh, on a monthly basis moving forward. Uh, I'm Mark Tobin, the, I guess, moderator host for this morning's event and the founder of Coffee Microcaps. Uh, so the structure is going to be, uh, we're over two hours. We've got four ASX microcap companies presenting, similar to the morning meeting. Uh, it's a 30 minute slot where we'll have roughly 20 minute presentation from the company and then 10 minutes for Q&A. If you do have any questions, please type the questions in the Q&A box and I'll moderate them at the end. Please don't use the chat function. Uh, the Q&A um, functionality uh, is the best way to go about it. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and it'll be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel probably mid next week. So if you want to rewatch uh, any of the presentations, you can, or if you can't stay for the full event, you can catch up on any that you missed on the YouTube channel. Uh, if you want to follow us, you can follow us at uh, Coffee Microcaps, YouTube for the recordings, LinkedIn. I also write uh, subscription newsletter which can be accessed via the Substack newsletter platform. Uh, I'm just going to quickly run through the four presenters this morning. So first up we've got uh, Dr. Stephen Snowdy from Visioneering Technologies. After that we're going to hand over to Dr. Chris Hart from Aventus Medical. From there we'll hand, hand over to Alex Redkey from Heramed Limited. And then finally, we're going to finish up with Nova Eye Medical and Tom Sperling is going to be taking us through that. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Stephen. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Stephen, you can start sharing yours. I can see your cover slide now, Stephen, so you're ready to go. Very good. Well, thank you, Mark, and good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, thanks for tuning in to hear a little bit about visioneering. Uh, let's see if I have a little trouble getting us to advance. That works. Okay, uh, so I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Visioneering Technologies. I joined the company, uh, first involvement was back in 2008 as a venture investor where uh, my venture firm, uh, you know, led the startup of the company, got it started, co-invested with uh, some groups out of Palo Alto. And in uh, 2013, uh, the board asked me to join the company as CEO. So I've been CEO of the company since 2013. 17 years of experience in life science and uh, venture investing executive management. My training is as a neurobiologist and academic scientist, uh, where I got my doctorate and also a master's of a business administration finance. Uh, we also have Tony Summer as part of our team. Tony is our senior VP of sales and marketing. Uh, Tony, prior to joining VTI, led one of the largest I care uh, sales forces in the world that of Bausch and Loam at the time, where he headed up uh, vision care sales in the United States, a so very germane, relevant experience there. And as you would expect, a very experienced board of directors at VTI with over 150, maybe 200 years experience uh, combined. Uh, just a quick overview of our securities, ASX code is VTI. We IPO'd the company in 2017, about a 29 million Aussie market cap. That is about three times our annualized revenue from last quarter, just under a billion shares uh, out on float. Uh, cash on hand at the end of the last quarter was around 5 million Aussie, which is enough money to take us into the third quarter of 2021. Uh, so very well capitalized. 
You'll recognize our larger investors, probably Thorny Investment Group, the largest uh, holder in the company with Regal on the register as well. A uh, wealthy individual named Paul Cozy, and then Charter Life Science and, and Memphis Biomed Ventures, two of the original venture firms uh, that have been in the company since 2008. I myself own a pretty good chunk of the company, 1.4%. Uh, that's cash purchase. And then another 4.5% or, uh, or so of the company in options. So what do we do? Uh, we're a contact lens company. And you know these aren't just any contact lenses. These are very unique, revolutionary in their optical design. And the reason that uh, we have the design that we do is to address two very high need and underserved populations. Uh, the first of those populations are nearsighted children. Uh, nearsightedness means that the kid can see things that are up close, but they cannot see things that are far away. Uh, so that's the nearsighted part. And of course, pediatric meaning child. Uh, so the technical term here is pediatric myopia. Pediatric myopia is a very significant eye disease uh, in the human populace. It affects uh, around a quarter to a third of children in the U.S., but 80 to 90 percent of children in many Asian countries, uh, Singapore and China, have actually declared pediatric myopia to be an epidemic. And the reason is, is that the worse the nearsightedness gets in a child, uh, this is a progressive disease. Their eyes get worse and worse each year that they age. But the worse their vision gets, the higher at uh, risk they are throughout their entire lifetime for blindness or other debilitating ocular uh, diseases. And uh, this is about a $2 billion addressable market, very unaddressed, unpenetrated in the United States, uh, about a $10 billion market opportunity that's addressable in China, of course, with other large markets in the other uh, Asian jurisdictions such as Singapore, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Korea, uh, Japan, uh, large markets available also in Europe. The other patient population that we address with exactly the same contact lenses, they're exactly the same, uh, is adults over the age of 45 who are losing the ability to see things up close. By up close, we mean a phone, um, a menu, you see these people in a restaurant, they're very easy to spot because they have the menu uh, at the end of a far outstretched arm. They have their iPhone with a light on trying to light up the menu. Uh, very, very clear indicator that that person is probably over the age of 45 to 50. Unfortunately, this loss of near vision, which is called presbyopia, occurs in almost everybody. So figure 95% of people in that 45 to 50 age range and almost 100% of people over uh, 50. The current contact lenses for these patients uh, aren't great. They've been around for about 20 years. Uh, and the problem with them is that they compromise either the near or the distance vision. It's very difficult to get both simultaneously. And addressing these patients is actually how Visioneering got started. The reason that it got started with a completely different design for these lenses uh, back in 2008. It's about a $3 billion addressable market in the United States and, of course, large markets outside the United States as well. Just a, a quick snapshot of our financial history. Uh, we really got the company started after we IPO'd in 2017 at the million dollar year, 2018 was 3.3 million US dollars. Uh, 2019, we grew 74% over 2018, turned in 5.6 million. And uh, then we got into 2020 and, and had a great start uh, in the first quarter. And uh, then we ran into COVID-19 and like many companies were very heavily impacted in the second quarter. But what a re recovery we had uh, in the September quarter the third quarter of 2020, we set all kinds of records. And I, I should point out that back in April, uh, in the second quarter, we did what a lot of companies did, uh, which is foresaw a difficult time coming. We cut the company by half. Uh, we laid off three quarters of our sales force just to get the cash in the company positioned for a long-term downturn due to the pandemic. Uh, but in the third quarter, we saw an extraordinary uh, recovery. Uh, we had cash receipts of 2.7 million Aussie, just under 2 million uh, US. We were cash flow positive for the first time, excluding our inventory purchases. 
Uh, we set a record uh, excluding a one-time purchase by Menacon in the fourth quarter of 19, uh, set a record for net revenue at 2.2 million uh, in the third quarter shipments to our US customers from our distributor at 2.4 million Aussie, uh, set a record for a gross margin even at 46%. And uh, very surprising to us, we also grew the number of active accounts. And active accounts are the accounts that ordered product within the quarter. Uh, it would be fair to expect a company in the middle of a pandemic who had just laid off half the company to actually lose accounts, but we actually grew accounts by a little over 10% uh, within the quarter, which, which was great news, news to see for us. And again, 2019 and the history of the company has uh, or demonstrated a very strong growth uh, for the company. Just a quick couple of quick notes on this in case you're wondering when you see it later on. Uh, shipments to US ECPs. ECPs are eye care professionals. And what, the reason we report this is we actually sell our product to distribution companies or fulfillment companies. And they hold inventory and they ship out the product to uh, their customers, which are the practitioners. Practitioners then sell product to patients. And uh, just to provide a lot of clarity and transparency into the company, we keep track of what those fulfillment companies are shipping to the customers so that there's uh, no effect of uh, stocking and unstocking at the distributor level. So it's a little bit, uh, shipments are a little bit more of a real-time readout uh, for revenue and the health of the company. Uh, but again, very strong third quarter, uh, very, very strong uh, position for the company coming out of the third quarter. Uh, surprisingly, we should also point out uh, just expectation wise, we haven't put out any forecasting uh, for the future. It's very difficult to forecast in this environment, but uh, we do know from history that the last quarter of the year for the entire industry tends to be the weakest quarter of the year. Uh, contact lens industry tends to contract in the last quarter of each year by 10 to 20%. Don't know that that's going to happen this time around. Uh, a lot of things have surprised us over the past few months, but uh, just to set that expectation. So uh, what is this myopia in children thing? Uh, again, it's a progressive disease. So limiting the progression is a very important part of treating nearsightedness in children. There are some things that have been used, a drug called atropine, which is used off-label in clinical trials for treating uh, the myopia progression in children, but not very widely used. Orthokeratology, these are hard lenses that are placed on a kid's eyes at night. Uh, this is another thing that's been tried for a while. It works fairly decently. It's actually used quite a bit in China. The drawbacks of these lenses are that they're expensive. They require daily sanitation, uh, which for children can be a bit dicey. Uh, if you have kids, you probably know that they're not the greatest at keeping things sanitized, which is super, super important, uh, especially in this day and age uh, with the pandemic. Uh, they also lose the effect of these lenses. They uh, tend to have to shift to other ways of clearing up their vision, like glasses or other types of contact lenses throughout the day. Uh, soft contact lenses, though, are somewhere that the industry has been moving towards. For quite a long time, just not a lot of success in that category yet for treating nearsightedness in children. Uh, and none have been widely adopted, though many have been tried. And so uh, our lenses, it's very interesting the way this launched back in 2016. We launched in the United States in that presbyopia population, but due to the design of the lenses, a lot of practitioners started using them to treat nearsightedness in kids for technical reasons that we can't quite cover here. And the data since then has become very compelling. So uh, we actually just presented at the Global Myopia Symposium uh, in October. And the latest data is showing that children wearing our lenses, even out to five years, the progression or the worsening of their nearsightedness over time uh, basically stops in most of these kids. So a uh, very powerful effect in slowing down the progression of nearsightedness in kids. And with 80 to 90 percent of children in many of the Asian nations being nearsighted, obviously very large markets for something that can do this. We're at the forefront of this thing called myopia in children. Uh, two years ago, this slide showing the companies that are interested in myopia would have been pretty much blank except for us and maybe Cooper Vision. Now, all of the major 
contact lens companies and vision care companies are starting to get into the myopia space. We're already starting to see some acquisitions and some consolidation in the industry. And you know, this slide is really just a picture of all the largest eye care companies. Medicon, which is now a partner for us, uh, we've entered a private label uh, agreement with Medicon for uh, Europe for myopia progression control. Uh, we're also a founding member of something called the Global Myopia Awareness Coalition, which is all of these large companies getting together to educate parents and practitioners on the importance of treating their sightedness in children, not just as a vision inconvenience, but actually as a progressive disease. Uh, just to give you a sense of how the markets break out around the world and what we've been doing, we are now approved, our contact lenses are approved in Europe, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, we just got approved in Canada, Hong Kong. Uh, we were approved now in Singapore and uh, still have a couple of international clearances to go in China uh, and uh, Japan. But over, this is just over the last couple of years that we've gotten all these clearances uh, just since we've been public in 2017. So not only have we been very successful in growing the company, growing revenue, uh, getting to a point where we're all, you know, very close to cash flow break even now, but also getting all these clearances around the world and some partnerships. Uh, one of our key partnerships is with Japan's largest contact lens company. They're called Menicon. And uh, we signed a deal with Menicon where they are a non-exclusive uh, seller and distributor of our contact lenses in children in Europe uh, under their own brand name, which is called Menicon Bloom. So Menicon Bloom is their brand new uh, branded pediatric uh, products and uh, we're a very big part of that portfolio now as they roll that out around the world. Uh, again, these lenses are not only used in children, but they are also used in adults over the age of 45. And the reason that they're used in over 45 adults is because they do a very good job at giving not only the distance vision that adults over the age of 45 need corrected so that they can see distance, but simultaneously correcting that near vision that they're losing as uh, they get older. Uh, just in response to COVID-19, to give you a sense of what we did, uh, again, back in April, we reduced the headcount by half in the company. We all gave up cash salaries in the company. Many of us uh, took stock in lieu of the cash that was owed us by companies just to keep cash in the company and because you know we think it's a great investment. Uh, we paused new product development uh, we paused the launch of new products, but we did retain our core team, our core sales team, our regulatory people, our quality people. Uh, so no interruptions of supply. And obviously uh, it's working based on our third quarter performance. We also brought in some government assistance and did a cap raise uh, back uh, a couple of months ago to make sure that we had plenty of cash uh, to get through the pandemic, which uh, looks like we do. And, you know, at least for the time being, we're just going to keep doing what we've been doing. Uh, we had a very successful quarter with a very scaled back team. Cash use uh, looks very, very good right now. Uh, we still have a lot of loyalty from the accounts that we already have. We're going to keep supporting our partners in uh, Europe uh, and our uh, Singapore and Hong Kong partner that we just signed up is called Oculus. We may do some additional Southeast Asia launches uh, in the near term, and we'll keep getting ready for a couple of new products uh, that we have that are technically ready, but uh, we're probably just not going to launch them until we start to see the market uh, recover a little bit more than it has. We have some other near term things that we're looking at doing that would include putting other companies' products into the bags of our salespeople just to make for a more efficient sales force uh, from a capital perspective. And uh, with that, Mark, uh, I can take any questions. Um, do you want me to stop sharing my screen? No, you can leave your uh, screen up there, Stephen, because it's got the contact details for anybody who might want to get in touch with them, um, Julia Post. Um, have any questions come through just on just yet on the um, live thing, but I did get a few that were emailed ahead of time for somebody who uh, couldn't join this, but was going to watch it back. Uh, they wanted to know about um, manufacturing of the lenses, where that takes place and how COVID, I guess, has disrupted 
supply chains and where you are with that in terms of getting product to all your various distributors in the various markets? Sure. So fortunately, um, airplanes are still flying, boats are still floating. Uh, and so we are able to get supplies from our OEM, uh, which is in Taiwan. Uh, and Taiwan has been pretty unaffected. Uh, they, they went after the uh, COVID-19 virus very effectively, very early and very aggressively. So the manufacturing itself has not been impacted by COVID-19. Uh, we continue to get product regularly uh, when we order it from them. And uh, they're doing really, really well. Uh, as far as getting product back out to our fulfillment companies uh, in the United States and our distribution and sales partners outside the United States, uh, no issues there as well. Uh, again, logistics delivery around the world has been relatively unimpacted uh, by the pandemic. And so right now we're not running into any supply or shipping issues. Okay. And then I'm just going to take the last question from this email and then we've got one that's come through on the, the live. Um, in terms of places like Singapore and I think, I can't remember if you said Japan or Korea where, you know, it's been designated a pandemic, are the products subsidized by government healthcare or is it a pure um, pay by the parents, I guess, if we take the kids one? Uh, we, we fortunately are in a self-pay industry, uh, so we don't have to deal with reimbursement from government. Um, there are some countries that have contact lens coverage under their insurance plans, uh, but typically, you know, those aren't really full coverage. They're just a uh, reduction in pricing, but the manufacturer gets the full benefit of pricing and the government does subsidize pricing somewhat. But in the United States, in Singapore, Hong Kong, Europe, Canada, all the places that we're currently selling product, uh, it is a patient pay uh, type of scenario. So we're not having to deal with reimbursement or go down the, the very long pathway that some medical device companies have to go down of trying to get reimbursement uh, from the government. Okay, great. And then once come to live, um, can you talk about your, I guess, intellectual property and how differentiated it is? Maybe I think, maybe if you drop back to that slide of um, all the different players and what they're kind of doing uh, in the space might be instructive. Yeah, that one. Yeah, so, yep, yep, no problem at all. So um, in the area of myopia, you know, there's going to be different ways of treating myopia progression in children. There's going to be drugs. There's going to be uh, orthokeratology lenses, which are these hard lenses that are worn overnight. And there's going to be soft lenses. Uh, within the soft lens space, which I, you know, I think is going to be the dominant way that myopia is treated in children, we have a very different design from what other companies are uh, choosing to use. Uh, and, you know, Cooper Vision is the only other company with a widely approved around the world soft contact lens for myopia control in children. They, they have a very different design than we do. Uh, the, both lenses work. Ours works extremely well uh, and provides excellent vision, uh, similar to that of glasses. But the approach, technical approach to achieving that is very different with our lenses and is patented uh, in Singapore. It's patented in China, which is the largest market in the world. Uh, may, it was on a slide, but may have uh, glossed over this. China is about a $10 billion market opportunity for myopia control uh, in children. And our lenses are patented both in the optical design that we use and in the use of that optical design uh, for treating myopia. Uh, we just received in the United States a new patent uh, back in August that covers using our optical design for the purpose of treating myopia in children. And that patent, again, has uh, already been issued in China, Singapore, and Australia now as well. Uh, so the answer to the question is optically, our lenses are very, very different. Uh, than what the other companies have been doing, uh, both in terms of presbyopia and what Cooper Vision has been doing in terms of myopia control. And we've patented that design, uh, you know, in, in quite a few countries now and patented the use of the design. 
uh, which is a separate patent in several countries. Okay. And then another one, oh, we, they're flying in now. Oh, hold on. Um, <laughs> can we hear some more details about um, the Menicon Europe rollout? Uh, how is it progressing? So uh, Europe is, uh, Menicon was supposed to start rolling out in March. Uh, that's mm. right when the pandemic started to hit. Uh, from March until the end of April, every optometrist in the world pretty much was closed. Uh, and so that uh, pushed back uh, Menicon's launch uh, during the, the summer as uh, practitioners and optometrists started opening back up. Uh, Menicon did start selling lenses in parts of Europe. Uh, they've been continuing to expand that uh, in Europe. But as you probably saw, uh, France and Germany now look like they're going to be going back into some amount of lockdown. And uh, so we don't know what that's going to look like uh, going through the rest of this year, early next year. But Medicon uh, has started selling the lenses. They were just starting to, to roll out. Uh, our other partner, uh, Oculus, over in Singapore and in Hong Kong, uh, they're starting to roll out uh, there as well. They're starting to sell product. Uh, Canada, one of the other places where we've just gotten approval and we're going to service Canada using our U.S. sales team. Uh, we've now started uh, selling product there as well. So even in the middle of the pandemic, we are starting to sell product through uh, our partners and starting our own efforts in Canada. Uh, but it is really, really difficult to see where things go uh, from here on out as the, the pandemic seems to be getting another foothold. Yeah. I think you did mention this, but maybe just clarify it, Stephen. Um, the deals with Oculus and Minicon, um in terms of exclusivity, and I believe they're not exclusive. So uh, are you having discussions with other potential partners, distributors? Uh, yes, we are. And just to, to make it very clear, the deals with Menicon and with Oculus are non-exclusive and they are cancelable uh, and are also assignable. And what all of that means, and the reason that we did all of that is to make sure that we maintain complete flexibility around business development and partnering. So for example, uh, even in Europe where Menicon is private labeling our product, we can private label for another company. We can, we can continue to sell the product under our own name. Uh, so, you know, we can pretty much do anything we, we want. And if uh, we choose to partner you know, additionally in other locations, uh, that's not an issue as well. Uh, so we have quite a bit of uh, flexibility from a strategic perspective with regard to partnering. Okay, and then final question before, because I want to move on to Chris, if you can just briefly talk about pricing. Do, do you have a price premium to, let's say, the Cooper lenses, or where do you guys sit in the, in, in the pricing spectrum for uh, the lenses you produce? So we have priced them at par with the Presbyopia lenses that are in the market. Uh, so, you know, this is a, a, a lens design called a multifocal, which, you know, all the companies offer a different type of multifocal lens for their Presbyopes. Uh, again, only Cooper Vision offering them uh, for children. But what we've chose to do that was different from Cooper Vision is we kept the pricing on par. Uh, Cooper Vision entered the United States with a very substantial premium, and they've been rolling it back ever since they've launched. Uh, and I think we'll, we'll start to get a feel for where the pricing settles down. But for now, we're trying to drive adoption. Uh, and that, you know, would say keep the pricing in line with his, historical multifocal contact lenses. And the lenses are also used for presbyopia. And when lenses are used for two different purposes, it's really, it's really difficult to play with the pricing. Okay, perfect. Stephen, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you very much. Uh, Great, Mark. I'd like to make a special mention to Stephen joining us from Atlanta. It's the end of his day there, and we're going to switch now from the East Coast to the West Coast because we have um, Dr. Chris Hart on the other side uh, waiting to jump in. Uh, Chris, if you want to start sharing your screen, we'll jump straight into your presentation. No worries, so uh, I'll get that up now. Yeah, I can see your cover slide now, Chris, if you want to 
yeah, you're in um, slide share mode now. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah, we can hear you fine. Thanks. Great. Excellent. Well, look, uh, you know, thanks everyone for attending. Thanks, Mark, for mediating or moderating. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how many people are new to the story and who already know the story, but I'll, I will do a, a high level um, before we click down on recent developments. So Venice is a device uh, manufacturer based in Brisbane, launching in the US at the moment with a proprietary technology to truly treat obstructive sleep apnea. I uh, developed the technology for myself and then started using it on patients and I founded the company several years ago. Uh, a number of clinical trials and um, I think we're in iteration 27.8 of the device now. We've, we've got a beautiful device that's been well received in the North American market as well as Australia. So um, you know, we have a mouth guard to treat sleep apnea. Um, mouth guards, generally speaking, have about a 50-50 success rate and by incorporating uh, a three-dimensional, 3D-printed integrated airway and some positive end expiratory pressure valves into that mouth guard, we've increased the success rate by over 80%. So increasing the reach of mouth guards to treat sleep apnea. Um, the available market at the moment, this is patients that have been diagnosed with sleep apnea, but that for whatever reason are not being treated. Uh, if, if we sold a device to those patients, um, that would represent a $2.4 billion opportunity. Only one in five patients have been diagnosed in North America with around about 30 million patients suffering from sleep apnea. We have a, a unique treatment uh, modality, which is combination therapy with a mouth guard and airway management. And, uh, because of this sort of unique model, we really needed to develop a unique clinical business model as well. And so we formed what we call a lab in lab model, where traditionally a patient would present to the dentist to receive therapy for an oral appliance after being referred for sleep, from a sleep position. Uh, we can put digital scanners inside the sleep facility and deliver the care on site. So as well as having a device that's highly efficacious, which much high, with much higher success rates, um, we shorten the patient journey. And at the same time, we've enabled the sleep uh, groups and the dentists to share in the revenue streams associated with that therapy. Um, we have contracted around 57 sites across North America. We've launched 30. Um, 15 are yet to come back online post-COVID, but we've managed to grow sales significantly uh, since our pre-COVID revenue build with the 15 sites that we do have launched with a lot of potential in the pipeline for those sites to come online uh, that were previously launched, additional sites that we have contracted, and we have an enormous funnel of deal flow as well. Uh, with those agreements, uh, we run mini clinics or we collaborate or assist uh, sleep docs and dentists to collaborate on mini clinics within the sleep facilities. There are quotas involved in those contracts for device sales. That, um, those minimum quotas for the contracted sites, it's around about $13 million in annualised revenue. Uh, for the ones we've launched, about 6.6. .6, and for the, the ones out of them that are currently seeing patients, um, sorry, I've just lost my light, um, around about $3.3 .3 million in annualised revenue. Due to COVID, um, you know, patients weren't able to come into the clinic, so we, we launched a telehealth platform in response to that. Most of our sleep physician partners are practising via telehealth at the moment, so we very quickly launched a telehealth solution, and that increased our sales conversion rates and has allowed us to continue to engage with patients uh, and, and with uh, fleet groups as we negotiate contracts and continue to launch sites through COVID. So it's obstructive sleep apnea, stopping breathing multiple times, uh, severe... Uh, healthcare effects, daytime sleepiness, lost productivity, increased accident risk, comorbidities, hypertension, heart disease, obesity, depression, um, cardiovascular risk. Um, and it happens when patients fall asleep and they <laughs> snore and then eventually their airway closes over and that leads to low oxygen levels uh, during sleep, which then leads to damage to some of our vital tissues. The treatment of choice at the moment is CPAP or continuous positive airway pressure. It's a mask uh, with an air pump attached. Um, we know that treats patients um, very well when it's worn, but we know that the majority of patients struggle with that therapy. If 100 patients are diagnosed with sleep apnea, 35 will refuse therapy straight off out of the 65 that try CPAP. 15 won't make it through a 30, a 90 day trial and out of the 50 that take one home, uh, at least half of them will abandon therapy in the first year. So it's very efficacious, but not well tolerated. Mouth guards, um, you know, they work around about 50% of the time. They're well tolerated. Um, they're worn on average in clinical studies, including our studies around about 6.1 hours a night. Um, but what we've done, we have now the compliance of mouth guards, which are very convenient CPAP in your pocket, if you will, um, combined with 
uh, efficacy and effectiveness approaching that as CPAP. And so when we show that to sleep physicians, they get quite excited about it. They ask, where can we get the therapy? And then we sort of say, look, the good news is we can help you deliver it to your patients in your clinics. Surgery um, is the next stage down. It's quite invasive, obviously, and probably um, is reserved for those more severe patients that have tried everything else. And you know, weight loss is the silver bullet for everything. We haven't found a solution to that as a human race so far. And I know I suffer from that condition. And then other behavioural modification uh, makes up some of the therapy as well. I actually call it um, matrimonial positional therapy when you know, your wife elbows you in the ribs and you roll over or you sleep down the corridor. And that's probably the most used therapy at the moment in market. So there's the CPAP with the face mask and the pump. As we said, it works well, but not well tolerated. Um, a few issues there with straps, pressure, noise, tethering, claustrophobia and discomfort, as well as a lack of portability. With our device, what we've done, if you look at those photos, we have a mouth guard that brings the jaw forward, but also an integrated airway that allows, allows air to pass below nasal soft palate obstruction, re reducing the negative pressures that are generated and preventing lateral wall collapse while at the same time stabilising the tongue. Um, so if you look at um, the uh, success rates there, incorporating that airway, and I'll get into it shortly, um, increases efficacy by about 20%. And then we have a what we call a PEEP valve or a positive end expiratory pressure valve, which increases another 30%, but I'll go into that shortly. So by utilising the airway and the positive end expiratory pressure valve, we increase that success rate from 50% up to 80%. There's 29 million Americans, 55% um, of the global market. Only 6 million are, have been diagnosed and half of them have abandoned therapy. So there's 3 million existing patients. We sell the device for 800 Australian dollars a unit. At the moment, it's about a 60% gross profit margin looking to drive those cogs down to generate an 80% gross profit margin in the coming quarters. Um, just on the patients that are diagnosed and not being treated, $2.4 billion opportunity. And as well as that, we have recurring revenue um, and some service fees associated. So a, a very significant opportunity. Uh, oral appliances are only 10% of the therapeutic market at the moment. They're forecast to grow at double the rate of CPAP in the coming years. Um, as I said, we're bypassing the nose where some snoring can occur in the soft bone where we can also have a collapse in the tongue base where it flops back, we can stabilise with the advancement device and we're reducing negative pressure swing and collapsibility. So the introduction of that airway and our randomised crossover studies led to a 20% increase in efficacy and success rate. And then when we introduced the valve as well, and that valve allows the air to pass inwards through that flapper valve. Now when we breathe back out, we breathe against those holes. And what happens there is the, the resistance leads to a pressure gradient building up and that pressure through the airway is diverted back into the oropharynx or the back of the throat. So normally what would happen is, and the main reason for the lack of efficacy in mouth guards and the abandonment of CPAP is nasal obstruction during the night, of which at least 82% of patients suffer from the sleep apnea. That leads to negative pressure swings building up and collapses in the soft palate and the tongue. Then the patient switches to mouth breathing. <laughs> And at that point, we lose traction on the mandible. So that's usually where therapy would fail, but with our airway and the valve, when that switch occurs, we actually get a ramping in efficacy of 50%. So we reduce residual events by 20% with the airway and a further 30% with the valve, in effect, making the mouth breathing and nasal obstruction, which was previously the problem, it turns into the therapy. So we're regulating the patient's breathing to stabilise their own airway. So it um, seems very simple, but it has some very elegant uh, physiological um, outcomes. So when we say to sleep dogs, why don't you use mouth guards more often? Um, they'll say, look, you know, it doesn't always work. Um, if I refer the patient to a dentist, I'm never going to see them again. And um, the dentist is going to charge them a lot of money. And then if you say to the dentist, why don't you do more sleep? They'll say, well, if I refer them to the sleep doc, they're going to put them on CPAP. I'm never going to see them again. So if you look at those objections, we've increased the effectiveness to CPAP-like levels for the vast majority of patients. And sleep docs will say, at last, you know, someone's got a mouth guard with efficacy above 70%. Where can we get it? And as I said before, we can place a little digital wand scanner in the surgery so the patient can be treated at the point of care. The patient isn't leaving the premises and isn't lost to follow up. And using this program, we're able to share some of the economic benefits um, of treating those patients between all the stakeholders. So it's a win-win-win for everyone involved. So here, you know, normally there's about 20 or 30 different steps for a patient to get a mouth guard um, from a diagnosis to a consultation to a CPAP trial, back for another consultation, pulling out a therapy, Googling a dentist, going to a dentist, maybe back to the sleep doc again, fitting a device, titration, follow up, back to the sleep doc. It's quite complex. With this model, we drop that scanner. If you look at the middle photo down the bottom left-hand corner, 
there's a little one scanner there which we wave around the mouth to take an image inside the mouth. The data gets uploaded. It's designed in Brisbane, the mouth guard, printed in North America and Oregon and Sydney for Australasia, and we ship those devices to the sleep clinic with a delivery to the patient. The patient's managed in collaboration between the dentist and the sleep physician uh, at the, within the sleep facility. <laughs> A, a recent quarter, you know, we had a, a reasonably rough June, as a lot of people did. Um, having said that, we continue to grow our funnel of sites. As I said, 57 contracted sites with 13 million annualised revenue once fully launched, and they're not fully launched at the moment. 30 sites launched that we have uh, at 6.6 .6 million annualised, and only about 15 of them are actively seeing patients at the moment. We're bringing back online three to four sites a month, and at the moment, um, the sites are trending uh, around about just under half quotas. Across North America, we're seeing reports that um, patient flow has decreased by more than half. Uh, we did switch to telehealth, which has been great. It's increased our conversion rate. We're actually generating more sales of the same number of sites that we had pre-COVID. And, you know, we're able to extend now into home care as well. We've developed a method to treat the patient in the home. So uh, when shutdowns come back or if home sheltering continues, we can treat the patient anywhere, anytime. We say, look, one click of the button and your patient's in care. So we really become a virtual um, lab in lab program to bring these patients into therapy uh, from wherever they are in their patient journey. And we've reduced our cash burn again. That will stay low. Uh, we're in about 1.5 to 1.6 million a quarter. And the COVID response we've overcome, the significant issues we have, we're growing again very quickly. We had booked revenues up 190% on the previous quarter in the same period last year. Annualised run rate up by uh, more than double. Uh, and we strengthen the balance sheet through COVID as well. Uh, 4.2 quarters of funding if we don't build revenue, but we're building revenue quite quickly at the moment. So when I look back, you know, we started talking about our Lab in Lab program back in June last year. At that point, we didn't actually have Optima, our OTV and Optima or FDA cleared. However, sleep groups were signing contracts ahead of approval. So that gives some idea of the demand for the clinical business model and the technology. Now, we got approval in the September quarter, at the end of September for Optima. We launched our first sites in October. We were building revenue um, into the March quarter. Then we got uh, struck by COVID. We lost uh, all but three sites initially. By the end of COVID, uh, we got about seven or eight back online. And now this quarter, we're back to 15 sites scanning. So we're 14 pre-COVID, 15 post-COVID. You can see some of those white um, sites there where we're still building books through telehealth and consulting with patients online. Some sites are still shut down, largely DME distributors of CPAP and independent sleep labs. Um, some of them are still shut down. And for all the sites we've got launched, we have almost as many uh, yet to be launched. And they're additional sites within existing contracts around sites that we've already launched. So we use a hub and spoke model where we we'll launch two or three initially and then expand um, around those initial sites within that group. So we'll be able to move quite quickly to open up more sites as things start to open up again. The revenue build again, uh, Optima cleared in September, launched in October, December quarter revenue build. Um, we were truncated in March. We were down to three or four sites uh, initially in COVID and started to open back up again and we're back on track now with our revenue build uh, pretty much in line of where we thought we would be had uh, COVID not occurred. So very proud of the team and their response to the pandemic and the way we've pivoted and managed to overcome with our telehealth and home care model extension, I think. You know, it's a very exciting addition to our lab and lab program. We do have a lag um, on receipts to revenue, so um, we would expect to collect the money we received. Uh, this We build this quarter, next quarter, with some additional funds. We have about a 60 to 90 day lag. When we sell a device, we're invoicing at the end of the month for the 30-day term on that and any service and support fee is a 60-day term. So it was dislocated during COVID. It came back to normal now and we're looking to build the receipts as well as revenue quarter on quarter moving forward. So at the end of the quarter, you know, we had half of our sites that we'd launched scanning with another 27 that we're aiming to bring online at the rate of three to four a month. Patient flow is subdued at the moment. Uh, current sites are trending under their quotas. Um, we're expecting that to continue uh, probably this quarter and in the next quarter, we're hoping post-March that things will go back to normal. In the meantime, we're launching additional sites as quickly as we can to give us a broader base to build revenue from so we can really start to accelerate uh, through calendar 2021. Uh, the December quarter will continue to grow. I don't think it'll be as strong as the previous quarter uh, with some seasonality and uh, with elections and brush fires and some uh, resurgence in COVID this quarter. Um, you know, we are seeing some disruptions in different places, but we are launching more sites to overcome that. So I think we'll grow this quarter again, grow uh, much more quickly, calendar 21. 
Um, <clears throat> and we have launched our lab in lab home care model uh, where we're treating patients in the home now. And that's to mirror the drop shipping of, of CPAP. So at the moment, the sleep docs will do a telehealth consultation. They'll write a prescription for CPAP and the CPAP gets sent in the mail. Now with us, they can write a prescription for our appliance. There'll be a telehealth consultation and we can treat the patient in their home. So uh, I think this home care model very much mimics the shift that's occurred in the market uh, and is a significant opportunity for us moving forward. We have uh, a deal funnel where we engage with groups that was sitting at $70 million last quarter in annualised revenue. And that's looking at the people we're negotiating with, looking at the patient flow and what quotas we may apply to those contracts uh, in the under negotiation. So a very big funnel of future um, demand there, which we're working to bring online over the coming quarters. Um, all of this points to a significant growth opportunity with multiple sites relaunching access to more sites, uh, a large deal funnel, our telehealth program and our home care extension. We've got good visibility on patient flow and the revenue build. Um, and we're really excited about what lies ahead um, come what may. Uh, it's not going to be smooth sailing or a straight line, but I think we will have some very strong quarter on quarter growth um, in the coming uh, coming quarters. So we're focusing on launching, relaunching as many sites as we can. We want to maximise and optimise those sites. Uh, we're continuing contract negotiations with quite a few ongoing, some of them with quite large groups. Uh, we're controlling costs as we build revenue. We want to increase cash flow from operations and driving cogs down to deliver an 80% gross profit margin over the coming couple of quarters. The XVEN valve is subject to a 510k approval in the US. We're looking to launch that uh, at the end of this year, early next year for approvals in 2021. And we're looking at taking the lab and lab program to other markets as well. But a great board, uh, Mel Bridges, Sue McClayman, uh, Australian NEDs, and Chair um, Paul Malloy, Jake Nunshara, Jossie, US Director, some phenomenal experience there, both operationally and, and in financial markets in the US. And obviously I'm there as founder and uh, MD CEO. Um, <clears throat> still very tightly held, our founders are at 20, uh, 24%, top 30 at 30, 32%, 44% uh, um, retail, and uh, strong balance sheet, as I said, over four years of, uh, four quarters of, of runway there. Revenue building um, quite nicely at the moment. I'm looking forward to the quarters ahead. Our patients are our main priority. We get you know great feedback from patients, testimonials coming all the time, but not just from patients, also dentists and sleep docs who are seeing their their patients' results on their sleep studies. You know some great uh, feedback coming from the US market with their disease being managed as effectively as CPAP for a lot of those patients who otherwise would have been outside of care. So that's always nice to see. And I think I've timed that well. Uh, any any questions? Yeah, we've got a good few questions, Chris, so we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, how many sleep labs are there in the US? I, I think maybe ballpark. And, and what's the barrier to signing up more sleep centers? Is it COVID-related disruptions or, um, you know, uh, other incumbents in there ahead of you? Sure. So there's around about, uh, I think, 7,000 sleep physicians in the US. The sleep labs are harder to determine. Um, there are some very large groups that can have hundreds or thousands of sites. Um, and generally speaking, the sleep physicians will be contracted maybe to a hospital, a university, and a sleep lab. They also run their own sleep labs. So it's a, a fairly um, heterogeneic market, but there's an awful lot of them. There's no impediment to signing them. Um, we have uh, enormous interest in that funnel deal funnel around $80 million annualised revenue we're bringing online. So we're just continuing to negotiate and sign those contracts. We are focusing uh, more on the sleep physician owned facilities where um, we're closer to the diagnosis and uh, the power of the pen leads to higher conversion rates. So at the moment, we're looking at the regional um, sleep physician owned type centres as a priority. Uh, but we're also, we have some large DME groups through Aeroflow that we launched with and they take longer to get online. Uh, they're further from the diagnosis, but that's, there are millions of patients in those facilities. So, you know, I think the 3 million patients that are outside of care are on the books of the DME distributors of CPAP. So no impediment to continue to grow that market and sign contracts. Okay, great. And then how many sites uh, that are up and running are achieving the contracted quota? And, you know, what's the average run rate per site per month? Sure. So there's only one achieving at the moment. Uh, before COVID, we wrote about two or three. It usually yeah. takes about four to six months from launch to achieve those, or almost taken that pre-COVID. Remember, we launched in October. By March, we had some sites trending at their quotas. Uh, then we were shut down, and now we're starting to open back up again. So we factored in that 
Um, for the physician-owned sleep labs, um, you get a ramp up of five units, then 10, then 15, then 20 over a four-month period. That appears to be accurate at the moment, but it's hard to tell. Um, the largest sleep labs and DMEs, a lot of them actually aren't back up on their feet yet. Uh, as they come back online, they'll probably take a little bit longer. Um, so at the moment, I think the average run rate is somewhere between five and 10 a month, um, and it varies uh, you know, from month to month. Uh, but we'd expect them you know, to probably remain around that Ten a month mark for the next quarter or two, and then start to accelerate again after that. As I said, our response is just to launch more sites, so we have plenty of sites that we can go to. And when we have sites run into trouble for whatever reason, we go to another site. So um, it's very low capex. Um, there's no fixed cost, so it's, it's a very flexible business model. We're able to um, adapt to you know the changes in market very quickly. Okay, great. And auto has been available in Australia for a while, but uh, adoption the questionnaire is saying has been low so far. Uh, any particular reason for that or has the focus just been more on the US market? Yeah, so Australia is 2% of the world market. It, it's not really a focus for us. We do have one person in the US that's sort of supporting the market there. Uh, most of our go to market team is in the US. We do sell, you know, quite a few devices there, but it's certainly not a focus for us. Uh, we're laser focused on rolling in a lab and program in North America. And that's where, you know, we're getting a lot more adoption uh, a lot earlier. Sleep physicians in particular in North America uh, are very excited about the opportunity to treat their patients with um, the airway technology and I'll be uh, been very well received over here. I'm sure at some point we'll go back and focus on the Aussie market, but you've got 55% of the US market and 2% of the world in the Australian market. Um, it doesn't make sense for us. In fact, the numbers didn't stack up. When we look at the invest in, investment that needed to be made to launch there, we would have had to get, I think, more than 80% market share for it to work. So we went to the US where it's a much bigger market and more in the north. Okay. And then I think you might touch this in your presentation, maybe just to confirm. Um, telehealth home care, is that being done by the CPAP competitors? Um at this stage due to COVID? So, yeah, what's happened is uh, CPAP in-lab titrations aren't able to be done at the moment. And so what sleep docs are doing, normally they might prescribe CPAP, get them fitted at the DME CPAP distributor, bring them back in for an in-lab uh, titration study. And that was a good revenue stream for them as well. They're not able to be done because of the increasing risk of spread of um, aerosols due to COVID. So they're drop shipping auto PAP now and gets shipped out in the mail. And that's being done by the large DME distributors. Um, from our point of view, the patients can come in for a scan, which is good, and they can do a study, a follow-up sleep study with the oral appliance in. So the, the sleep facilities do see that as a, an opportunity, A, to manage their patients' care, which is first and foremost, but also there's additional revenue there that they can garner from those patients who, for whatever reason, can't tolerate CPAP. But, yeah, the DME distributors of CPAP are drop shipping. Um, we're using a similar model now <clears throat> as well for the oral appliances, so we're just launching that right now. Okay. And if we haven't got any more questions, I know our next presenter is lined up, so we might um, cut to them early. Um, Chris, thank you very much for that uh, update and for joining us all the way from Los Angeles. If you just want to stop sharing your screen, thank you. And I know we have Alex Radke from Heramed Online. Alex, uh, do you want to start sharing your screen? I know we're a, a little bit early. And uh, I'd also like to thank Alex, who's uh, joining us from San Diego. So just down the coast from Chris. Uh, yeah, I can see your cover slide now, Alex. Awesome. No, I appreciate it, Mark. Great, so uh, I appreciate everyone for tuning in. Um, my name is Alex Radke, I'm based in San Diego, California. Um, I work for Paramed, which is really focused on pregnancy and transforming maternity care. And so I'll kind of bri briefly walk you through the history of maternity care and kind of set the scene for how we're transforming it and then get into our commercialization strategy and some uh, exciting upcoming milestones that we have in front of us. So just as a quick overview, uh, Haramed is a technology company um, born out of Israel uh, with some brilliant med tech engineers. Uh, it set out to really redefine and evolve the pregnancy experience for expecting moms and the care providers, uh, mostly through innovative connected smart devices uh, to enable remote monitoring of pregnant patients. And so on the left, you have our Harabit device, and that's really the, 
the centerpiece uh, of our offering and we really built around that. And I'll dive into a little bit about what that means, but uh, our market size, we typically are, are primarily are focused on the US and Australia. Um, the US has just under 4 million births a year. Australia is right around 315,000 births. Um, and we clinically collaborate with two of the greatest uh, healthcare providers uh, in the world, one of which is the Mayo Clinic, uh, which is based here in the United States, annually ranked as the best healthcare, healthcare system in the world, uh, known for its innovation. And there's a key reason why we're collaborating with them. Uh, the other one is Jindal Love Health Campus, which is over in Perth. Uh, it's part of Ramsey Healthcare, the largest private hospital system in Australia. Uh, we currently have regulatory approvals globally um, here in the US with the FDA in Europe, Australia, India, and Israel. So we've got a global footprint. So women have a disproportionate and influential role in healthcare decision making. 90% um, of them are the primary healthcare decision maker. 80% uh, of them control the household, household spend. 75% uh, of them are more likely to use digital products. Uh, and 87% of them here in the United States have said that the parental leave policy was important to them when considering whether to join a job. Uh, however, we have not really designed care models and products to fit their ever evolving needs. And that's really where we come into play. And so if you look at the historical care model that is prenatal care, and this is really before birth. Um, it has not been touched since about 1930. I repeat that again, it has not been touched since about 1930. And this is just a simple overview of what the, the basic standard of care for a low risk patient looks like. It's about 12 to 14 in office visits. Each visit's about 15 minutes with her OB. Um, it, it's very labor intensive to be able to offer those appointments. And obviously it interrupts the daily life of the patient. I mean, you can imagine a patient in a rural part of Western Australia that has to drive several hours to be able to attend an appointment. Uh, this is not an easy thing to comply with. And this is just for the basic standard of care. There's other patients who are higher risk uh, that require a significant amount more patient visits, uh, sometimes as often as two or three times a week uh, going to their OBGYN. And obviously that has a significant impact on the patient experience, right? In between visits early on in the pregnancy when anxiety is the highest, uh, particularly for first time moms, the gap between physician appointments and therefore contact uh, is about four weeks. And so from the patient's perspective, there's no real perception of kind of continuity or communication uh, for them. And there's really a lack of connection to their OB because of such, um, you know, such a wide gap between those appointments. And then during those appointments, I mean, the physicians, there's a physician shortage uh, of obstetricians here in the States that's growing increasingly uh, worse. And so there's really minimal time that the patient gets to spend with their obstetrician. And the appointment schedule and everything was really built around the physician's needs. And so this hasn't really been touched um, until recently. And so what we're looking at now is infusing elements of telehealth that have already been adopted in other clinical areas, as you just heard on the last panelist, um, you know, there offers a playbook for implementing telehealth, but up until today, um, there really hasn't been strong adoption in pregnancy because of the lack of technology to enable it. And there was a recent study that just came out that basically said, you know, the current prenatal care guidelines, the one I just referenced, does not match what patients want. And patients are very open, so there's a strong consumer demand for alternative models of prenatal care, including remote monitoring. And there's been a number of studies that have come out within the past two to three years that have clearly demonstrated benefits in a number of different categories. Uh, one in sort of the operational category is looking at lower rates of no-show appointments or cancellations. This just makes it much more convenient when you're talking about a telehealth visit versus having a go in person. Same thing with lower reported uh, rates of stress, uh, higher patient satisfaction. You know, those are all obvious just because you have now a greater connection uh, with your obstetrician and ability to deliver that via telehealth. Um, and then you have increased confidence. You have visit related costs that are significantly lower for a telehealth uh, visit versus an office visit. And on the patient side, you have significant time savings from drive time to wait time, uh, particularly when you're talking about now doing this for 12 to 14 office visits uh, back and forth. And that's, again, that's just the basic standard of care. So there's really some clear advantages uh, and, and unique offerings that you can create when you talk about telehealth in pregnancy. 
Um, and this is sort of the evolution. This is how we see pregnancy developing over a longer time horizon. Uh, historically, uh, traditional prenatal care is, was the only way. And then one of our clinical collaborators, again, you know, the, the leading Mayo Clinic, one of the best health systems in the world, uh, had this pioneering project, which I'll touch on in, in a little bit, called OB-NEST. And that really set the proof of concept or set the stage uh, for what's about to come. And that's where we fit in because we really enable the future. And the future of tomorrow is really smart and connected using different devices and integrating via mobile apps. Um, and the future then is artificially intelligent. We have another project with Mayo Clinic looking at being able to offer things such as clinical decision support and uh, helping uh, physicians make better decisions and earlier detection of potential problems uh, for pregnant patients. And so Mayo Clinic's OB-NEST model was really a pioneering endeavor. Uh, as I said before, the, the prenatal care model hadn't been touched since 1930. And then in 2011, Mayo decided to challenge that. And they spent five years of research. It was a coordinated effort between their obstetrician, uh, their obstetrics department, and their center for innovation. And they trialed and tested over 14 different care options. And they published a big, huge paper on this. This was really a groundbreaking study because what it, what it demonstrated was the proof of concept that you can reduce those 12 to 14 in-person visits down a significant amount by substituting a, a set number of those for telehealth visits or virtual visits. Um, and some of the other uh, interesting data points was it significantly increased patient satisfaction all the way up to 95%. And it also decreased the patient's perceived stress, all the while without changing or affecting any of the prenatal care standards. So there was no decrease in clinical quality, but there was an increase in, in other uh, opportunities there. And so this was really done using standard uh, you know, physician office-based devices, uh, blood pressure cuff you're used to seeing in the office, and, and a, a piece of equipment called the fetal Doppler. Um, now, these devices were designed for use by a trained professional in the office. They were not designed for home use by a untrained patient. And so there were some limitations in terms of the broader adoption of this care model. And so while it set the stage uh, for the opportunity, there were several limitations that didn't really allow it to truly flourish, one of which was the devices are not connected and really rely on patient input uh, and are not designed for home use. And the, the three real devices that a obstetrician needs to monitor a low risk patient is uh, pretty basic. I mean, there's a scale, a blood pressure monitor, and a fetal Doppler. Now, the fetal Doppler, what it does is it's, de it's a device that has uh, sort of a probe to it, and it allows the doctor uh, to place that probe on the expecting patient's uh, stomach and be able to find the baby's heartbeat. Now, to a doctor who has, has training, that's a, a relatively routine thing for them to do. But to an untrained patient, it's very, very challenging because what you can do is you can pick up uh, additional noises. You can confuse the mother's heartbeat with the baby's heartbeat, and that can give a false sense of reassurance. Now, for the other two devices, you know, a scale and a blood pressure monitor, easily accept, accessible. Um, you can find those at your local pharmacy. You can find them on, online. Um, they're very easy to use and they're very clinically accurate. But to date, there had never been a fetal Doppler that was easily accessible, easy to use at home, and was clinically accurate. And so the reason that, that uh, pregnancy, and specifically telehealth and pregnancy, didn't take off was because the doctors simply didn't have the confidence that the uh, medical devices that they were used to using in their office on their patients could be used remotely by an untrained patient with the same level of clinical accuracy. And that's where our device comes in. So this is the centerpiece uh, of our solution. It's called the Herabeat. Um, it took multiple years of uh, incredible Israeli innovation um, by some brilliant engineers, one of which is our CEO and co-founder uh, who built this device. And so there's a ton of technology packed inside this device along with intellectual property, uh, which gives us a unique competitive advantage but that's the size of the device you see right there. Uh, it, it's small. It looks like it belongs in an Apple store. It's very sleek. It doesn't look like a medical device. And that was designed intentional because we wanted this to be used by patients. And you'll see it's connected to a smartphone. And no other fetal Doppler is connected to a smartphone. So this offers incredible advantages, three of which 
um, are that it's able to distinguish because ours has an extra sensor in it, right? A, a traditional fetal Doppler only has an ultrasound probe. It doesn't have an optical sensor. Now, if you're used to using an Apple Watch or a Fitbit and you flip it over on the back, uh, you'll notice a green light. That's an optical sensor. That's what's measuring your heartbeat. And so what our device does is it's able to detect the fetal heart rate, just like a traditional in-office fetal Doppler would, but then it's also able to detect rate, detect the mother's heartbeat. And so we're able to distinguish between the two. So now the physicians have confidence that when a patient is using this, they're picking up the appropriate heartbeat and we can distinguish between those. Now, the second major thing is, is it's very difficult for a lay person or an untrained person to take a traditional doctor's office device and be able to move it around the belly and find the appropriate placement for the probe to find where the fetus is. And so what ours does is because it's connected to a smartphone, it has step-by-step -step directions for the patient to be able to move the device around their stomach and instruct them where to place it. And so it's got all kinds of software algorithms and additional IP behind that that allows us to find the, uh, where the appropriate location for the device should be on the pregnant person's stomach. And finally, one of the really key differentiators now in, in the world of telehealth and remote monitoring is no other field Doppler can be shared electronically. It's basically just a LED readout on a screen that shows you a number. The patient then has to call their doctor and, and give them that information. And so with ours, everything is easily shareable. It can be sent to the cloud and we can send it directly to a doctor. And so to date, we've gotten over uh, 30,000 fetal heart rates detected and constantly growing that. And so this is just some of the intellectual property and proprietary technology of the Herabee. And they exist both on the hardware side as well as on the software side. And as I said before, there's uh, you know, optical sensors, there's ultrasound sensors, um, there's motion detection, there's hospital grade quality packed into this device. And there's the smart search function, which now translates the ability of a doctor who has years of training into the hands of a patient and makes this an easy to use product, project or a, a product for any uh, lay person. And so this was a big milestone that we recently announced uh, on the ASX. This was a huge trial for us. It was a independent clinical trial uh, run out of Jindalup Health Campus by Dr. Paul Porter, who's a very influential and noted physician uh, over in Western Australia. And basically what we did at a high level was look at two things. Now there were a ton of things in which we studied, but at a very simple sense, we looked at two things. We gave the device to doctors and trained clinicians and allowed them to use it on patients in the clinic and then compared our device to what they're used to in the hospital, not just in the outpatient or in the clinic, but in the hospital. And that's a, a CTG machine, a cardio tachyography machine. And we were able to demonstrate that our device is equally as accurate within 0.3 BPM mean difference of a hospital grade device. Now those devices run five to $10,000. Ours is a couple hundred dollars, 400 Australian. And so that was kind of phase one is looking at using this by trained professionals to compare it to what they're used to in the hospital. The next phase of this was now giving it to 81 pregnant women and allowing them to use the device completely untrained. So just look following the, the smartphone app instructions, which are done both verbally, text, uh, and through pictures. And we were able to achieve 100% fetal heart rate detection by untrained patients. I repeat, that's 100% fetal heart rate detection in all sessions. Now the usability and the satisfaction too was in the 96th to 100th percentile. And so patients really enjoy using this because it allows them to connect in a different way with their unborn baby we also have some unique features where they're able to actually share the audio recording with their friends and family. So it's a nice emotional experience. And finally, you know, the, the outputs of the patient recorded ones were interpretable 97% of the time by an obstetrician. So this was really a, a groundbreaking study for us because now it gives us additional scientific evidence which strengthens our commercial value proposition as we look towards uh, the commercial opportunities with this device. And finally, one thing to note is the uh, care team or the clinical team that was investigating this grew so excited by what the device could do. They're now expanding this to look at additional applications of the device in the hospital, things such as transport monitor um, or additional use cases that we had not conceived previously, but they had such excitement that they wanted to expand the trial and look at it further. Now, we started with the device, and the device is really one element of an entire end-to-end -end solution, both a hardware and a software piece. 
And so when I mentioned Mayo Clinic, you, you may recall there were sort of three critical uh, medical data points that are required to facilitate remote care. Uh, one of those is obviously the baby's heartbeat. Another one is blood pressure and the other one's weight. And now that's for low risk patients. There's additional things with, uh, you know, diabetic patients uh, and some other uh, underlying health conditions that we, they would need more of. And so what we wanted to do is take Mayo Clinic's uh, process, which was a very analog process. It was done using a lot of human capital. It didn't leverage technology uh, in a smart sense and be able to digitally integrate that. And the way we do that is we obviously have the Herabeat device, which is smart and therefore can be connected. We have then built in coordination and collaboration with Mayo Clinic, a patient facing mobile app that then can collect additional medical data points that are necessary for the physician. Things like their blood pressure, things like their weight, things like their mood. We can send educational resources to the patient. And so recall, I said that there's a gap of about four weeks between physician office visits. When well, now you, the physician can send to a patient tasks in which they do between the appointments. So now the patient feels a greater sense of connectivity. They have a task-based thing, so they don't have to remember all this stuff. They can feel safe and secure knowing that the doctor has given them this program to follow. And then on the doctor side of that, we're able to send that information over to the doctor. And now what our, our uh, mobile app is able to do is actually connect into additional smart devices. Now, things like blood pressure cuffs are basically a commodity, things like connected scales, connected glucometers, all are pretty commoditized. And so we're able to plug into all of those. And essentially you can now have a connected kit that goes into the patient's home to remotely monitor them. So now this creates kind of an end-to-end -end solution, which uh, we're, this quarter we're finalizing getting ready for a commercial launch. And so this is just a zoom in of the maternity companion app. And as you can see, it has sort of week by week instructions for how to perform measurements, uh, get into the tasks and looks at some of the other uh, data points. And now these information can then be sent to the doctor in multiple means. Uh, the doctor can even connect into it or they can uh, be sent sort of a summary report. And this just kind of goes into this. So it seamlessly integrates into the clinical workflows, which is really something critical. Technology is great to a doctor, but if it disrupts the doctor's workflow in an already busy practice, the, the, the likelihood of adoption sinks significantly. So we want to make this as easy as possibly able to integrate into what they already have. And so the provider benefits are clear for telehealth. Um, you know, on average, a, there was one study that showed that a doctor saves about $90 when switching from a traditional office visit to a telemedicine based visit. So there's significant cost savings on a per visit basis. Uh, in addition to new patient acquisition, patient satisfaction, and just a demand for consumers for an alternative care option. And so this is usually what we, we talk to doctors about, about free up some of the exam room space and uh, being able to optimize their time for spending it with more complex patients. And so our business model is relatively simple. Um, we want people to, we're gonna work with leading hospitals. As I said before, we have Joondalup Health Campus and Mayo Clinic as kind of our anchor key opinion leaders. Um, they carry a lot of influence and weight in terms of innovation uh, in this space. And so we look to partner and align with um, large hospitals and private obstetrician clinics. Um, we have multiple ways of generating revenue. Uh, there's sort of a setup or an establishment fee. And then we have a recurring revenue model, which is a per user per month uh, SaaS based fee for the, the mobile app. And then we have a one time activation fee for most of the Herabeat um, device. Now, the nice thing about the Herabeat is because it was designed as a medical grade device, um, it's actually able to be reused. And so it's not one device per patient. Uh, it can actually be recirculated. We see a lot of success there and allows us to um, create alternative models and lower price points uh, for used equipment, which then opens the aperture for additional adoption. And so we've got a relatively standard pricing structure. Really, one of the driving variables between those ranges is the customizability and the size of the organization and kind of whether they want something just out of the box or they want to customize it to be able to get there. And so we've got a number of partnerships now on the back of that clinical trial, uh, which validated a lot of what we talked about uh, in, in, in the pipeline here. And this has been sort of our strategic plat, plat, uh, pathway. We have been focused really on building a best in class proprietary platform. We've now got that done. Um, we have focused on getting pilots and clinical trials. Now that's done and we're still uh, looking to advance that, but then those trials continuously strengthen our commercial position. Um, and again, aligning with key opinion leaders, we have a strong pipeline, which I'll share in a second, uh, with some additional hospital systems and some large uh, private obstetricians clinics. 
And uh, one of our near-term goals here is getting uh, our, our paying customers on the Heracare platform uh, to be able to, to demonstrate the commercial viability there. And then finally, um, growing market share in, in 2021, now that we've seen the advent of uh, remote adoption for telehealth. So this is our current pipeline. You'll see some of the size of some of these facilities, um, primarily focused in Australia and the US. Uh, we do have other activities globally. Um, we prioritize the US and Australia just because they have A, a very large market, but more importantly, B, um, their influence in the clinical community uh, is, is globally versus some of these other countries. Um, they don't have a strong influence coming into the United States. So we've kind of focused our efforts in the US and Australia and developed some partnership opportunities with some other countries as well. And so this just touches on sort of our growth horizons and looking into the future. Um, we're sort of at, we checked all the boxes in horizon one here. Horizon two is looking at getting some of those paid pilots, early adopters of that entire end-to-end -end solution. Um, and then really for us, it's focused on getting up that risk curve. Uh, for low risk patients, this offers a significant alternative uh, in terms of patient satisfaction, but longer term what we wanna get to is the ability to monitor, monitor some of those higher risk patients. Uh, those patients consume a lot of institutional resources and being able to focus on looking at those high risk ones is where the insurance companies and the pharmaceutical companies and other large uh, enterprise organizations have a keen interest in being able to do that. And so our technology is uniquely positioned to be able to service that segment of the market. And so this is, is sort of how we're looking into the future. So again, just some near-term news flow catalyst. Um, we're expanding the Jindalip trial uh, with Dr. Paul Porter. Um, we've got a couple paid pilots in the pipeline that we're working on executing. Um, and then we have a great partnership uh, with eCare21, which is a leading uh, remote monitoring software solution based here in the United States uh, that typically had been in senior care uh, and is now shifting into pregnancy because of us. And they've got a great relationship with Dell Technologies as well as some other uh, enterprise relationships there that we're, we're hoping to get a good uh, sales channel through. And then the next year, it's really focused on really going from where we were as a product R&D uh, uh, you know, clinical trial company now to a commercial organization and being able to expand those relationships. And so just in summary, um, COVID-19 kind of presented an acceleration of the adoption of remote monitoring. And so we've got the only medical grade clinically validated maternity care platform underpinned by our HeraBeat device, which you see on the right. And the maternity market has been completely untouched. Here in the States, it's about $111 billion in insurance spend uh, to cover uh, patients. And there's a number of federal government opportunities around rural access and telehealth specific to maternity um, and a number of congressional bills going through the legislative process to allocate dollars towards that. And so we're really excited about where this is going and where we're heading. And so I appreciate uh, the time and happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, as a father of twins, I can tell you, yeah, if that was a, a low risk patient amount of visits, so when you've got twins, you, you can literally be seeing an obstetrician nearly every week and then going to see specialist sonographers um, because of the high risk nature of having twins. So yeah, it, it can be highly disruptive when you're when you're visiting them weekly or, or, or bi-weekly. I just wanted to quickly ask for my own interest. After that study from the Mayo Clinic came out, have they revised? I'm guessing now this is from the obstetrician society of america or whatever have they revised the standard of care or have they not got to that point yet where i guess this study is bill being digested by the obstetrician medical community so it was and it, that's actually a great question so before covid um there were about six health systems out of over 600 here in the united states that had adopted the Mayo Clinic model of offering telehealth as an alternative to pregnant patients. COVID happened in every single place was looking for the ability to reduce the in-person exposure of pregnant patients. And so the obstetrician society, or the professional society here in the States called ACOG, A-C-O-G, um, and they, in response to COVID, issued guidance for adopting telehealth into pregnancy. And now this is becoming a accepted alternative standard of care to the traditional model. And so now they're backing it. And what we've seen is other health systems have developed uh, an even further reduced visit schedule. So we've actually seen some health systems reduce the in-office visits all the way down to four. And the only reason for those four is because they require hospital-grade equipment to do things like the anatomy ultrasound or some lab work or some other things. 
And so they've actually driven it down even further. Uh, and there's studies coming out now, what seems like almost weekly in response to the pandemic because it forced everybody into this, demonstrating the value of this. So we've seen an increased adoption from the clinical side of a willingness to accept this as an alternative care model. Great. And then we uh, question here just quickly. Um, it seems like an excellent device, but expectant mothers may feel anxious about not meeting the doctor regularly. How do you handle this issue? I mean, is, is that a, I guess is that for doctor patient to kind of agree on the on the care model where some patients would be more open to telehealth and others won't? Yeah, we've seen an interesting demographic breakdown. Um, you have, and this is, again, it's sort of an offer um, of both. There are some patients who prefer having frequent visits with their doctor, don't mind the travel, uh, and that typically tends to be a first-time pregnant patient. Uh, when you have someone who's been through it, they say, you know what, I don't want to have to take the time off work. I don't want to have to find daycare or have to deal with the logistics of getting to the doctor particularly for low risk patients. Uh, most of the visits are pretty normal and routine. They're very easy. It's just some overview stuff. Um, and so there's sort of a demographic breakdown of who prefers which, um, but those that offer, particularly for the, those who are working, this offers a, a alternative to that. So it's not really a, this is the only care model, but is a nice alternative for those um, who don't want to have to deal with the logistics of getting into the doctor. And the other piece of this is uh, that the mobile app is able to connect in with the doctor. So there feels like there's still a continuity and connection to the doctor that they're able to still access. Okay, great. And then in terms of the feedback from the, from the obstetricians, I mean, this frees up a lot of their time, which I think you slightly referred to in one of your slides about, uh, you know, it frees up their time maybe to see more patients, but have you got a sense of, you know, could this mean they could take on, you know, 10% more patients or 15% more patients because they, uh, I guess, can just more effectively and efficiently uh, handle more patients? Or, you know, if I was an obstetrician, if I could, you know, grow my customer base uh, for the want of a kind of a crude uh, statement by 10%, I mean, that must be a very attractive um, proposition for them. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, clinic space is at a premium. It's very expensive, uh, you know, to add physical space uh, to a, a doctor's office. And so this frees up a lot of physical capacity in exchange for virtual. Uh, and virtual just offers a, a unique opportunity in terms of scheduling. And so what really drives that is the willingness of their patient population uh, to convert. And so we've seen some um, get a significant number of their patients wanting to use this as an alternative. And so it offers the unique ability to raise sort of the innovation identity. I mean, you have a, uh, this is a little bit different than remote monitoring in the senior population who is not as tech savvy. The younger generation has a demand and a desire for everything to be done via mobile apps these days. Um, so this affords the opportunity to kind of market and sell yourself as an innovative clinic and an ability to acquire uh, new patients. And that's one of the kind of value levers that we've seen that excites doctors the most is this kind of gives them a bit of a unique edge to be able to track new patients. Okay. And I know it's a, a major cost burden for uh, the obstetrics uh, specialty is, you know, the professional indemnity insurance they have to um, pay. Where have the insurers, I guess, uh, inserted themselves here? You know, are they comfortable with uh, the telehead our telehealth aspect, uh, you know, have they kind of flagged any extra risks that, you know, doctors might be exposing themselves to? No, we've actually seen, um, you know, so, so COVID forced a lot of the insurance companies to have to accept this. Mm -hmm. And some of the limitations of the adoption of telehealth has been that the insurance companies or the government uh, has not been willing to reimburse or fund telehealth appointments to the same level as in-office appointments. But the difference in pregnancy versus almost all other disease conditions um, is that the pregnancy experience is an entire episode of care, right? It's a predefined set number of visits with your doctor. And so it's paid all in one lump sum. It's not paid on a per, per visit basis. And so their doctor receives this lump sum on a per uh, patient basis for all of the appointments in the delivery. Um, and so 
the switching from an office visit to a telehealth visit, the insurance companies have said, yes, that is an acceptable exchange and we'll pay that to the same level. So we'll pay the same kind of bundled payment is what we call it uh, for all of the office visits. And so now the doctor doesn't affect their top line by switching to telehealth, but now they, they affect their, their cost base because a telehealth visit is significantly cheaper because you don't need the exam room, or I'm sorry, the exam room, the waiting times, all those things. Um, and so the insurance companies have said, yes, that's great. Now, this is still so new that the insurance companies are looking for now additional ways in which they can get patients in rural populations or underserved populations who have a challenge adhering to the basic standard of care, getting to the doctor's office for you know, those 12 and 14 visits. This offers a unique opportunity. So we've seen some insurance companies now uh, wanting to send devices into the home to increase the adherence to the basic standard of care. So we think there's an exciting opportunity for that as well. Okay, and then the the perennial question uh, of, um, I guess, data security, patient data security, um, you know, doctor patient uh, privilege. Um, you know, there's a lot of moving parts, I guess, between, um, you know, the iPhone, then sending it into the, you know, the doctor's uh, software system. Um, what kind of cybersecurity measures are in place around the, the whole ecosystem? Oh, yeah. I mean, we take patient privacy with the utmost uh, respect and concern. And so we have all HIPAA secure and, and all um, local government uh, requirements met to be able to securely send data between patient uh, and doctor. And so we're, we are very cognizant of what that brings um, to the table. We're very, very sensitive to that. So we have all the necessary safeguards in place uh, in terms of being able to comply with those things. And we have a very scalable model because we sit on some cloud servers that allow for that to happen in multiple countries. Um, so when we look towards global expansion, that, that's not an issue. And all of those cloud vendors are, are certified uh, with the appropriate folks. And so that's always a key concern of ours is that data security and, um, you know, hospital IT departments won't let you in the door anymore. I mean, they, they give you tens and tens and tens of pages of uh, survey reports to make sure that you're compliant. So that's, that's a key focus of ours. Okay, great. Alex, uh, thank you very much for your time. I know it's a late afternoon there in <laughs> San Diego. So I'll let you go on a Friday um, and we're going to take our final presenter now. I'm delighted to have Mr. Tom Sperling from Nova Eye Medical. Tom, if you want to start sharing your screen. Uh, uh, yep. And Just... I mean, Tom should be, uh, should be no um, stranger to ASX Healthcare Investors, having been involved with Alex for a long time. Mm -hmm. that? If you, if, can you hear me, print, uh, Mark? I can hear you perfectly. If you just want to share your presentation, if you have it. I've done that. Uh, is no, it come up yet? No, you're sharing your video. Uh, so I'm uh -huh. just going to stop that for a second. Uh, if you hit that share screen button and then select your present. Yeah, I think we're on the right track now, Tom. Okay. okay. I can see your, if you just want to put into slideshow mode. Yep. Yep. Uh, yep. That, there we are. There we are. Yeah. Now we're, we're good to go on our side, Tom. Okay. I can see the cover slide now. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Mark. And thanks for listening, uh, audience. Uh, this is a story of Nova Eye Medical, um, ophthalmology company with the very appropriate ticker EYEI. Um, there's our disclaimer. So uh, Nova Eye Medical has changed its name in a legal sense. Um, it was the uh, LX Medical Lasers Limited uh, has now changed its name to Nova Eye Medical. We did that following the divestment of the cap of the capital equipment business, the business that sold lasers and ultrasound, and the payment of a sixty-one million dollar distribution to our shareholders um, uh, earlier this year in July. Now the company uh, it it that sale involves selling a most about revenue of about sixty-five million dollars a year. Uh, 
and our brand, Alex. So we now trade as Nova Eye Medical and we are focusing on the fastest growing segment of the ophthalmic market that is consumable surgical devices for treating glaucoma or for managing glaucoma. Glaucoma is a chronic disease. It can't be solved. It can just be treated. Um, just a quick, tiny background on glaucoma. Uh, there's 82 million people in the world with it. Uh, it is a disease of uh, the, uh, it's a failure of the irrigation systems in the eye. Um, there are blockages that are occur, occur as a result of those blockages. The fluid that runs through your eye that keeps it healthy uh, gets trapped in various parts. That trap builds up pressure, can crush the optic nerve and glaucoma untreated go, uh, is, uh, can make a person go blind. Um, uh, glaucoma surgical devices, those devices that are uh, in, used, uh, you know, we use surgical instruments in an operating room to treat uh, glaucoma. It's in a, uh, our devices, the iTrack and the recently acquired Multino um, are a provider, the basis of a portfolio of novel glaucoma devices that we can leverage our own sales and marketing infrastructure, particularly in the United States. Uh, glaucoma um, management is in a period of renaissance. It's a high growth area uh, with the realization that pharmaceuticals, that drops, that need to be put in your eye every day do not represent the best treatment option. And device solutions have demonstrated um, that they have great efficacy. Uh, efficacy is measured by the reduction in pressure in the eye uh, as uh, eye pressure is measured with us. That it, some of you would have been had glasses and the optometrist would put a puff of air in your, into your eye. He's measuring your eye pressure there. Uh, high eye reduction in intraocular pressure, IOP, and reduction in the amount of medications that you must take each day is how we measure the effectiveness of a surgical solution for glaucoma. Um, so we have, in addition to that, we have a very exciting, um, uh, our business will fund the commercialization of our proprietary 2RT laser therapy for treating a retinal disease age-related macular degeneration. We really consider our business as having two parts and I'll get into that a bit further. But glaucoma is the focus of Nova Eye Medical. Our current technologies, there are three. The two, uh, the eye track, uh, which you can see there is a catheter. Uh, that catheter is gently inserted into the irrigation system in your eye. That irrigation system runs around the um, colored part of your eye basically. It's, it's, it goes in there, clears blockages, and then is gently withdrawn. And in doing so, uh, we pump in its hydraulic fluid, biocompatible hydraulic fluid, for want of a better word, that flushes that irrigation system. So we have a ream and flush, a very simple plumbing operation. Uh, it leaves nothing behind that then gives uh, the uh, the, the eye's natural ir irrigation system a prime to get it going again. People with glaucoma are generally, generally uh, it's a disease for people over the age of 50 and 60, mostly. Um, and so our eye track device, uh, that one on the left of there with a little a light is inserted temporarily during a four minute operation, removed, primes the system and the patient goes away um, his system gets going again. The Multino device there, that they're, they're actually fingers. You can see uh, it's a little plastic device um, as big as your thumbnail that is inserted permanently into the eye of suffering severe or late stage glaucoma. So none of us really would want a piece of plastic as big as a thumbnail in your eye, but you will have that if you've got such bad glaucoma, there are no options left. So uh, that, that is, there are our two glaucoma products. Alpha Ret, which is our um, commercial body for, for taking 2RT, is a laser for um, treating patients in the early stage of having macular degeneration. On glaucoma, we have, as I've tried to describe, early, moderate and late stage glaucoma. 
we have iTrack and Multino, which can be used as I've described there in various stages. And our company's focus is identifying those gaps in the um, glaucoma treatment cycle that offer opportunity for new products and new procedures, either derivatives of our existing product acquisition or development of new products. That's an important use of funds um, uh, for our company. Our business at the moment uh, has about 50 people. Um, our uh, headquarters for the US business is in Fremont in the um, San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, we have a team of uh, sales people spread around the United States. We have manufacturing of the iTrack device in the United States. Uh, and we have our Alpharet FDA program for 2RT running out of that office in the United States. In Germany, we've just established um, our uh, Nova Eye Medical GmbH to uh, Germany's the second largest market for us. Um, uh, and so we uh, are building a team there. In Australia, we're headquartered here in Australia, in Adelaide, um, with some advanced R&D management and um, uh, the coordination, in particular, the um, management of our Alpharet 2RT program. In New Zealand, we have the manufacturing of the Multino device. Uh, that was a recently acquired business on the South Island of New Zealand. A very, it's a family owned, it was a family owned company, uh, and it has a nice little production set up in Dunedin. Uh, key statistics for EYE, uh, market cap as of yesterday was about $46 million. Uh, we have uh, cash, we've got a bit more of cash than that in the bank, but the sale, we owe some tax to the tax department in February uh, from the profit on the sale of the laser and ultrasound business. So what we call pro forma cash is net of that amount. Um, the enterprise valuation is the mathematics from it. We're, about 14% owned by directors and management. Our revenues were 12.8 million in F20. Um, that was, we'll talk about that, was materially affected by COVID. Uh, F20 was loss making and we are, there is a cash flow from continuing operations last year. Uh, I will, you know, that's on the decline, but um, the, the company LX Medical Lasers had a, um, was a profitable business. So we've sold that, distributed the money, and we've kept enough to fund the strategy that's described in this document. Here is a bit more on the detailed profit and loss account. Um, uh, our sales of the iTrack device, 14 million in F19 and 11.5 million in F20, were materially affected by COVID in March, April, May, and June. It was uh, a quite a, a devastating reduction in the um, surgical procedures going on there. Uh, and we, uh, we've seen some recovery of that since June. It's actually, but as we all know right now, as of like last week, this week, uh, things are dramatically changing all over the world, except thankfully in Australia. Uh, our Multino business, um, Multino, as I said, is a device for late stage um, glaucoma drainage. Um, it's a permanent implant. There are really two other companies in the world selling similar devices, Johnson & Johnson, a very large company um, with 29% market share of a, a market. It just slipped off this slide. The global market for this is about 100 million, uh, 100 million uh, US dollars a year. Uh, so we have a tiny share of that. Um, and we're working quickly during this, since the acquisition, we've had it for two months to grow those sales. New World Medical is the other company that has a device similar. New World Medical is not a large company. Its revenues are less than $100 million. Uh, Johnson & Johnson is obviously a large company. And we are, um, but we're basically putting Multino, th Multino through our existing uh, sales and marketing infrastructure. Now, Alpharet was established during this last, during this current month as the commercial arm to establish, uh, to, to facilitate the development of 2RT, which is a very long-term, it's been a very long-term project, but it's a very, um, it's very important to our company. It, 2RT is 
groundbreaking laser technology for treating macular degeneration in its early stage. The second dot point I have currently, AMD therapy is restricted to treating patients in the late stage of the disease and the market for pharmaceuticals for treating those is very, very large. In Australia, um, it's about $400 million a year is spent just in Australia and that's on drugs for treating AMD more than any other chronic disease therapy on the Australian pharmaceutical benefit scheme. Our device, our 2RT from Alpharet, is applied to patients in the high risk intermediate stages of the disease and it defers the, late, the blinding late stage uh, consequences of macular degeneration. Macular degeneration is the leading cause of blindness in the developed world for people over the age of 50. At my parents' 80th birthday, 80, 80th birthday, all the guests either had glaucoma, but most had macular degeneration as well. This slide depicts where it fits over time. So you have the health of the retina on the y-axis and age on the, on the x-axis. Over time, naturally vision declines until death. Um, someone with AMD, you've got the big fat red line there headed down towards the pink parts of that slide, which show the time at which uh, injections are applied. I think I've actually got that on the next slide. Yeah. So we apply um, uh, the pharmaceuticals via uh, an injection directly into the eye is taken when it hits that sort of that pink area down the bottom where you've got visual difficulties. We aim to apply the laser earlier in the disease state to a defer um, and permanently defer uh, the trend, the trans um, uh, formation into late stage disease. Our device has been the subject of a very large, well-controlled clinical study, phase two, uh, which in a post hoc analysis, unfortunately showed substantial benefits, a 77% reduction in the rate of progression to late stage disease for, for the treated group compared to a control group. That's fourfold reduction in the rate of progression. Now, uh, it was, uh, it, 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 it is the result of a, an analysis that we did. 75% um, of the patients responded well, 25% of the patients with a particular uh, predisposition, a different phenotype known as reticular pseudodrusum did not respond as well. That technically compromised the statistics and has um, causes us to uh, basically, we're going to have to conduct another study. Um, this result, though, has provides wonderful guidance on a follow up study. This is a substantial unmet need. Uh, $55 million is our, uh, 55 million people a year is our estimate, um, even after allowing for those patients that may not be eligible for the treatment due to that, that phenotype. As of now, um, we have that study which showed via a post hoc analysis that we have something that no one else in the world has. We have um, a project to expand um, our existing indication from the US FDA, we have a limited indication for the use of this device, but we'd like to include it to get it, um, it to have it include intermediate AMD, and that will require an additional pivotal study. So we are in negotiations with the FDA about the shape and size of that study. Uh, we, we've done quite well over the last 12 months in getting that together. We anticipate filing an investigational device exemption for a study. Um, it will be a very large, it will be a large study, three year follow up, it'll be a, a seminal piece of work, uh, and we'll be partnering for the funding of that study. Uh, our ferret will be, uh, see, uh, well, we are, you know, we're in discussions with various people that might want to take, um, help us bring this to market. So, outlook. We're not issuing any definitive financial um, projections as a small, effectively a startup again. We will continue to invest in the iTrack clinical and Multano clinical market development in prep preparation for aggressive sales drive post COVID-19. Uh, we have a product development program 
to um, put together a next generation eye track, which makes eye track simpler for doctors to use, uh, which we want to deploy uh, in the second half of FY21, FY21. And we want to file that IDE with the uh, US FDA. We have significantly reduced our operating costs, our, um, and we're a small, uh, we're a, a tight little corporate headquarters here in Adelaide. Uh, so thanks, Mark. That's 15 minutes. Okay, great. Thanks, Tom. Um, I have uh, one or two questions in ahead a, a of time for kind of mm -hmm. that, uh, that's uh, somebody couldn't couldn't join us. Um, w one of the questions was, um, um, will the, I guess, the eye track and the Maltino stuff allow you to, I guess, be self-sufficient cash-wise while the development of Alpharet and possibly other products um, happens in tandem or in the background, shall we say? Mm -hmm. So, so obviously, um, we are, you know, for want of a better word, burning cash. We think that we have a um, any public company can't have so much cash in it that it keeps burning money. So, we we have a my guidance on that at the moment is. We lost 3.7 million of cash last year and there's 26. So that gives a four year runway under that bit of maths. Mm -hmm. um, but we are, we are doing, I, I believe we're doing better than that at the moment. So I think that runway is sufficient uh, for us to achieve what we want to achieve. We want to bring, <coughs> it, it's, a, it's a fairly large in, investment in a three year study for our, the Alpharet work. So um, we will be partnering for that. We're not expecting our shareholders or our $26 million to cover that. But we, we believe the runway the, uh, the, the runway is good for us to show substantial sales growth and um, to get to a, um, you know, it, w within that time frame. Okay. And then uh, for Alpha Ret, um, once uh, the phase two study is redone, um, mm -hmm. What's the, what's the next step from there? Do you have to go to uh, a phase three study or? No, no, no. It, I, I wouldn't say um, a phase three study is kind of a pharmaceutical thing. This is what we've termed a, fim, a pivotal study that will provide um, a indication for use from the um, US Federal Drug and Administ Food and Drug Administration. And so we would then have a device we could sell. Now, um, that would be, you know, my view is that's a very, very valuable um, indication for use. We have our uh, manufacturing in place. We have uh, good IP. Um, and so we think, we think by then we'll be able to find a way to commercialize that one way or another and crystallize value for our shareholders very quickly. Okay, and that actually the third and final question from the ones I got beforehand was um, on that Alpharetta, yeah, is it a case of pushing it then through your own sales and distribution or what's the, I guess, the plan for commercializing Alpharetta? Is it, you know, distributing with somebody else, partnering with uh, your so clinical yeah. partner? Um, I think... All of those options are on the table. I mean, this would be a very large, it's a very large project. We had um, the, the LX sales and marketing um, channel um, would have been able to handle it theoretically. Um, we still, you know, so there's, there are companies out there that could do that. Um, but um, I think, I think we'll have something very, very valuable at the at the end of a successful trial. We'll have something very, very valuable, and our shareholders will have waited, uh, been very patient. So I think we'd be looking for a very um, to to crystallise value as fast as we possibly can. Okay, great. That's all the questions I had ahead of time. Let me just check if we had any come in via the live. Not nothing. If nobody okay. has any further questions for Tom, I'm going to let him let him go tom thank you very much for Thanks, for joining us and uh, as i said the all of these have been recorded and they'll be going up on the youtube channel probably tuesday or wednesday of next week if anybody wants to uh catch them back um and i'll be uh sharing them 
on the on the Twitter feed of, of when it's live. Uh, so with that, I'd like to end this first sector specialist uh, conference and thank all our participants, uh, especially if coming from so many different time zones and different locations. We had Atlanta, Los Angeles, San Diego and Adelaide. So we all went according to plan. Uh, and I'm going to end there for now. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.